Yeah, but today, Brendan is going to talk about how to model the epistemic probabilities of traditionals. Let's welcome Brendan. Thank you very much. It's always a great pleasure to, to be back at Rutgers, um, especially when I have a project this uh, fun. This is a new project that I uh, just stumbled into uh, last, I think, Jan just January of this year. I decided I was going to take a couple weeks off from emails and everything else and just read some David Lewis papers from the 70s. And in the process of doing that, I discovered an inconsistency in Lewis's notion of rationality, which led to this project. So this is really a tale of two David Lewis papers and also two different conceptions he had of what, a, what it takes for some constraint uh, on an initial degree of belief function to be a rational requirement. So the first paper I'm going to talk about is, was written in 1976, was published in 76, was actually written a little earlier than that, um, called Probabilities of Conditionals and Conditional Probabilities. This is a very famous paper. It led to a lot of research, both in philosophy and linguistics, uh, for reasons that I'll, I'll explain. In that paper, he presupposes a very strong conception of what rationality requires of an agent's initial credences or degrees of belief. And specifically, he assumes that if something is a rational requirement on an initial credence function, then it has to hold in what I'll call a fully resilient way, and I'll explain what that is shortly. Because this is a very such a strong notion of rationality, it leads to triviality results, and these are very famous, and I'll explain those triviality results uh, in the first part of the talk. I, you're using words that I, what is a rational requirement and what is a triviality? Yeah, I'll, I'll explain all this. This, oh, is just, this is just an overview. Yeah. So, four years later, he published another paper, not about conditionals, not about degrees of belief involving conditionals, but about degrees of belief involving chance, objective chance. Uh, famous paper called Subjective's Guide to Objective Chance. In that paper, he has a weaker, more permissive notion of rationality. And uh, specifically, he doesn't require what I'll call full resiliency. And I'll, again, I'll, I'll clarify what that means in a bit. He identifies what he calls inadmissible exceptions to resiliency and thereby avoids a, an analogous triviality result, which I'll go through in, in detail when we, when we get to that. The 76 paper led many people to reject what I'm going to call the equation, which is this constraint uh, on initial credence involving conditionals. But the 1980 paper led many people to accept what's called the principal principle, which is an analogous kind of constraint involving chance, um, constraint on initial credence, but involving chance instead of conditionals. The two notions of rationality are I incompatible, really. They're, you know, they don't really play well together. And so what I'm going to explain is, I think the later more permissive notion is the correct one. And if you look at what Lewis says in that later paper about chance, and you just do sort of the obvious analogous move for conditionals, then you get a much more charitable reading of this thing called the equation, which avoids trivialities. And not only avoids trivialities, but it seems to, it just seems to carve the problem at its joints. Hey, Dean. Thanks for coming. Sorry, Ann. No, not at all. Good to see you. So, yeah, no, I was just saying, I'll be talking about two David Lewis papers, um, which, are, which don't hang together, they're incompatible with each other. I discovered this incompatibil incompatibility earlier this year, and I'm going to explain how to take the, the later paper, which has a weaker notion of rationality, and apply that back to the earlier stuff. And, you, and what you get is a charitable interpretation of this principle, the equation. Um, and, and also one which seems to be empirically more adequate linguistically, and which I'm now starting to realize seems to play well with various semantical stories and logical stories about the conditional. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of these papers in some detail with an emphasis on the notions of rationality that are implicit in the papers, uh, and then I'll explain how to use Lewis 1980 to fix Lewis 1976 since they can't both be right, as we'll see. Okay, so for the conditionals paper, all we need is a very simple class of probability models. We're going to work with a very, very simple class of probability models. We're going to have a prior probability function, an initial probability function, and it's only going to be involve three atomic sentences. 
Uh, P and Q, which are just meant to be factual, simple factual claims, J just think in terms of games of chance. That's sort of the canonical kind of cases that I'm going to talk about. Very simple games of chance. So maybe I toss a die, and we'll see a, the example later. is just we toss a die, and there are certain predictions about how the die comes out. Very, very simple claims. And so these P's and Q's are going to be simple factual claims about, about games of chance. And then I'm going to have this third atomic sentence, which I'm going to call P arrow Q, but that's just a name for a random variable that's distinct from P and Q. It's just a third atomic sentence, if you will, or a third random, dichotomous random variable. I'm assuming nothing about the relation between them at first, okay? and then we'll look at constraints on this, on this model, this class of models. The idea is I want you to extra systematically interpret that P arrow Q thing as the indicative conditional in English, if P then Q. That's the, that's the intended interpretation. Okay, and we'll see how that, how that plays out. Okay, so the equation. Um, Ernie Adams and Bob Stalnecker back in the 60s proposed a constraint on initial credence, a very simple constraint, regarding how confident you should be in a conditional statement. And their proposal was the probability of the conditional should just be the conditional probability of its consequent given its antecedent, where this is just standard conditional probability here. Nothing fancy, just... This is just Kolmogorov finite probability theory. Okay, very, very elementary. So they uh, clearly didn't have in mind the material conditional for it. That's right. I'll come back to that. In the example at the end, you'll see that there's basically two different ways of thinking about the conditional. This way and a way that is more in line with the material conditional analysis. So I'll come, I'll come back to that. So that's, that's right. This is, this is a distinct way of thinking. Um, that will become clear in the example later. We'll, we can illustrate that. Okay, so this is a very simple constraint. It's not a crazy idea. I mean, you might, have, you might have thought, yeah, beliefs about conditionals and conditional beliefs. Makes sense. Okay, it's, it's not a, it, on its face, it's not a crazy idea. So now, Lewis came along, and in this 1976 paper, he presupposes, and I'll get into the details of this in a bit, but he basically assumes that if the equation is rationally required, that is, it really is a rational requirement that agents align their credences and conditionals according to the conditional probability, then the constraint must hold in what I'll call a fully resilient way. In other words, he assumes that if that's a rational requirement, then so is what I'll call the resilient equation, which is much stronger. The resilient equation says the equation holds, and it continues to hold, no matter what the agent might learn, no matter which proposition X, which factual proposition X, the agent might learn. So this is just a vast strengthening of the equation. So it says, for any proposition x you might learn, provided that it's compatible with the antecedent of the conditional, the equation should continue to hold when you conditionalize on x. That is what I'll call the resilient equation. In general, to resilientify a constraint is just to say that it has to continue to hold no matter what you learn. So you get something like this. And we'll see, for the principal principle, there'll be an analogous resilientification of that, too. Okay, now... A bunch of triviality results have been proven based on the resilient equation. A few years ago, I proved that the strongest possible triviality result, which I'll explain in detail in the next slide, is the following. Turns out, the resilient equation is equivalent to what I'll call triviality. And uh, triviality is really strong. It says that this conjunction, P and Q if and only if the conditional, P if, if P then Q, that has to have probability 1. What that means is there's only two states of possible worlds that can have positive probability. So let me, let's actually look at what the models look like. Okay, so now here's a more rigorous discussion. So here we have our three atomic sentences. So we have eight states or possible worlds. We can parameterize those using seven parameters. If you impose the equation as a constraint, then the only effect that has is it reduces the number of degrees of freedom by 1. Essentially, one of these has to become a function of the other six. So I just let g be a function of a through f. That's just what happens when you solve the equation. Not trivial. It only reduces the number of degrees of freedom by one. But if you impose the resilient equation, uh, as I show in this paper I mentioned that's cited in the slides, now you're down to one degree of freedom. The only states that can have positive probability are this one 
and this one, and you'll see those are exactly the states in which P is true, and furthermore, the biconditional connecting these two is true, because either they're both false or they're both true. That's trivial. That's very trivial, clearly. Um, so the resilient equation is not a rational requirement. <laughs> okay, that, clearly that's true because triviality isn't. Okay, now um, what's weird about this, what's super weird, and I'm surprised that I never noticed this until this year because I've worked on this for a long time. What's weird about this is it's not at all clear where this assumption comes from that if a constraint holds initially, it has to hold resiliently if it's going to be really a rational requirement. What Lewis says in the 76 paper, of course, doesn't entail that. It, it, it doesn't even support it. So here's what Lewis says. It's a very short paper, the 76 paper. He says, the class of all those probability functions that represent possible systems of belief is closed under conditionalizing. Okay, fair enough. Rational change of belief can never take one to, uh, to a subjective probability function outside this class. And change of belief should go according to conditionalizing on what was learned. That's all fine. All that says, essentially, is that probabilism and conditionalization are rational requirements. Uh, that does not entail that any constraint on, on initial credence, if it's going to be rational, if it's going to be a rational requirement, it has to hold resilient. It just doesn't, doesn't follow. Um, now, of course, some constraints do hold fully resiliently. For instance, probabilism. Suppose your initial credence function is probabilistic. Well, then it's a theorem of the probability calculus that if you conditionalize, then whatever you end up with is also a probability function. That's one of the first things you prove when you learn probability, that conditional probability is a probability. So probabilism is, is certainly fully resilient. But the question is, are any other substantive constraints on initial credence fully resilient? I want to say, I don't think so. I certainly don't think so, and for reasons that will become clear. Lewis didn't think so either, really. That became clearer in the later paper. So it's kind of mysterious uh, what's going on in this in this paper. So Can here, I ask you a question about yeah, it? is the um, I mean the thought that someone might have is that this constraint, if it holds, it should hold for anybody, whatever the other beliefs the person might have. Yeah, yeah. And so you might That's go from thought. that yeah. to the to think that was yeah. Yeah, we should, let's talk, I can, let's I can see yeah. how somebody might be sucked into thinking yeah. about things. Yeah, let's talk about that. I mean, I actually have some conject historical conjectures about why he didn't see the connection and didn't, didn't see the, the gap in the argument, and, but, he, but he did see the analogous gap in the later argument. Like that. So it, we should come back to that. I think there's a lot of reasons that play into it. But it is somewhat mysterious when you look back now in light of what Lewis says later, as, as we'll see. But let's come back to that. Okay, so here's my reconstruction of one weird thing about this literature is there's all these trivial results, but no one ever tries to just give an argument against the Adams thesis or against the equation. Like, what is the argument that goes from the triviality arguments to rejection of the thesis as a rational problem? I'm going to just do it as a reductio. It would have to be, I think, something like this. Suppose for reductio that the equation is a rational requirement on initial credence. Here comes the bad step. Therefore, it must hold fully resiliently. That's the bad step. Once you get there, now the rest of the argument's good. Because if that were true, if that did follow, then it would mean that the resilient equation must be a rational requirement. But we know triviality is clearly not a rational requirement. Contradiction. So the equation must not have been a rational requirement after all. That must be, something like that must be what the argument implicitly people have met, although no one's ever really, as far as I know, articulated it. And it was my attempt to articulate it when I realized that it's not a very good argument. The, the yeah. um this if p then q, I mean, is that well defined, or is that we're taking that to be how we understand it? We'll come back to that. Yeah, re remember that. We'll come back to that later. It's I'm just taking it to be an atomic sentence now, with no inter with no interpretation. Remind me about that later, because that's going to play into how does the how does my story about the epistemology play with the semantics and the logic of the condition? I okay. I would, well, I don't know if maybe this is related or not, but if you in that case, how could you even I don't even know what it, how could this possibly be a rational requirement? Isn't it just, at that point, it's a definition, right? You're saying the probability of P implies Q equals. No, 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 the idea is, the way I'm understanding it is, it's being proposed as a rational requirement, as an epistemic constraint on your degrees of belief. It's like, you ought to be such that you satisfy it. Didn't Adam, I don't remember this so well, I read Adam's book a long time ago, but didn't Adam think of the arrow not as any kind of real 
connective, but that it, something along the line that, that I had Only to say. after the triviality results. This is what's really weird I about this that, literature. In 65, in Adam's original paper, he's doing logic. He wants to know about the logic of the conditional. He's talking about inference and epistemology. What, how should you form beliefs? What inferences are reasonable uh, for an agent to make regarding the conditional and so on? Only after the triviality results did he change his tune and come to think, oh, this doesn't express a proposition. Mm -hmm. It's not. Okay. When was that? Uh, 70, 73, 74, when he learned about the results. Um, but in 65, the paper is clearly doing straight up epistemology, straight up logic. I went to a couple of his classes in 1970. Yeah, yeah. He was my intellectual grandfather. Ellery Ells was one of my advisors, and Ellery was one of his students. And I, I didn't go to more than two. That didn't make any sense to me. <laughs> he, was, he was my colleague for a while at Berkeley, really nice guy. Um, anyway, so well, let's come back to these issues, though, in the discussion. That there's, I have a lot to say about that, and I have some slides at the end that are relevant to this, so we, we can come back to that. In any case, the implicit assumption here that two follows from one or something uh, is something Lewis explicitly rejects four years later, okay? Um, and rightly so, I would argue. That's just not a good inference from one to two. What's fascinating, and, and also strange, is that Lewis had a very interesting mind. He must have had a very interesting mind, because in the 1980 paper, there he's doing mostly metaphysics, and he's not really doing semantics or logic or epistemology. I mean, he's doing epistemology, but through the lens of <coughs> metaphysics of chance. Nonetheless, in that paper, in the chance paper, there's some really valuable things about how to avoid an analogous triviality result for the principal principle. So when you go to 1980, Lewis doesn't really discuss triviality there, but I'm going to explain there's a, there's a completely analogous triviality result, which Lewis manages to avoid in, I think, just the right way, without really explicitly thinking about triviality, just by thinking about the metaphysics and the epistemology of chance. Super interesting. Um, so that's what I want to turn to next, the 1980 paper. So in this paper on chance, Lewis maintains that the principal principle, which I'll call PP, is a rational requirement on initial credence. And here's what PP says. It says, your initial credence function should be such that the probability you assign to P, given that the chance of P is equal to C, should be C. In other words, initially you should align your, credence, your credences in P with known chances or uh, learned chances, if that's all you learn. I see where you're going. Yeah, you no, know, no, it's it's a kind of a, it's a straight up analogy. It's a very direct analogy. Lewis knows full well, but not necessarily for the reasons I'm going to point out. But he seems to be well aware that this can't hold fully resiliently. Consider the following schema, which I'll call PP sub X, which is just what you would look at if you wanted to resilientify PP. You'd say, oh, well, if that's a rational requirement of initial credence, then it should continue to hold no matter what you learn, no matter what X you might learn. But of course, that's crazy. Um, that's crazy for a lot of reasons. I mean, I'll, Lewis, I'll, I'll mention some of the reasons Lewis thought it was crazy, but it's crazy because there's just a, a totally analogous triviality result that, that results from this, the resilientification of this. If you say, no matter what the agent learns, the principal principle should continue to hold, then here's what follows. Um, now we're going to have a language in which we have three atomic sentences, but they're different now. Now we have P, which again is some factual claim. Then we have the chance of P is equal to 1 and the chance of P is equal to 0. So consider that language now, those three atomic sentences. And then you can show that if you require the principle, principle to hold resiliently, then only two states can have non-zero probability. The state that says P is true and it has chance 1, and the state that says P is false and it has chance 0. Strangely, Lewis is not at all swayed by the reductio that you could build from this triviality result. So just to show you what the triviality looks like, okay, by analogy with the other one, so now we have three atomic senses, different ones this time. P, chance of P zero, chance of P equal to one. Some of these start off with zero probability because since this is a function, these can't both be true. Okay, so those have to be zero because different values of the function. Okay, but you still have one, two, three, four, five degrees of freedom. So you're still doing okay. When you impose the principal principle, you drop down to three degrees of freedom. And then when you impose the resilient principle principle, you drop down to one degree of freedom. And so only these two states, the one in which P is true and it has chance one, and the one in which P is false and it has chance zero, those are the only states that can have positive probability. 
very structurally analogous triviality result. You're down to one degree of freedom. Okay, so here's a reductio of the principal principle, which of course no one should accept, but I'm just copying and pasting from the previous one. Suppose for reductio that the principal principle is a rational primary non-initial credence. Then it must hold fully resiliently. That's the bad step. Well, that would mean resilient PP is a rational requirement. But, of course, PP triviality is not a rational requirement. Contradiction. So the principal principle must not have been a rational requirement all along. No one should be swayed by this argument. Lewis is not, as he shouldn't be. And in fact, Lewis explicitly rejects the step from one to two. Not because of triviality. He doesn't discuss triviality in the paper. For other reasons, just having to do with the metaphysics and the epistemology of chance. Independently of the triviality. What he does, which I think is absolutely right, he introduces what he calls a notion of admissibility. And all admissibility really is, it's a quantifier restriction on the resilient principle principle. It identifies those axes for which this universal claim does hold, is a rational requirement. Okay. And now Lewis's discussion of invisibility is, is kind of interesting. For him, it wasn't based on triviality. It was based on things like, what if you had a crystal ball? And someone's going to toss a coin, uh, coin tomorrow. And let's say it's, it's a fair coin. Uh, what credence should you now assign to Atlantic heads? Well, a half, according to the principal principle. But what if somebody with a crystal ball told you what the outcome was? Well, you shouldn't be a half anymore. So, admit, so resiliency fails, because that's inadmissible evidence, you see? So admissibility is just a quantifier restriction on the resilient principle principle so as to restore its status as a rational requirement. And I think he's totally right. And in fact, I'll get into specifically what he says, and I think even specifically in the details he's right, which is weird, because he's not being motivated by formal considerations at all, just by intuitions about metaphysics and epistemology of chance. So, let's just think for a second about triviality and what it suggests about quote-unquote admissibility. Well, one thing we know is that P and its negation, those can't be admissible in general, right? That's like the crystal ball case. If you learn P for sure, well, then you should assign credence 1 to P. Even if you already know what the chance is, that just trumps the chance, okay? So, information like P or not P trumps the chance information, so you shouldn't stick to the chances, okay? That's analogous to the fact that if you look back at the triviality results for the equation I showed in that paper, that actually you only need two instance of, instances of it to get the full triviality. Can I ask a dumb question? Yeah, sure. Can chances change? Yeah, chances can change. So you could time index everything. Sure. Okay. Yeah, and that's what he does in the, in the paper, oh. which is sensible. Oh. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so in the case of the equation, you only need these two instances the denial of the consequent and the material conditional to derive the full triviality. You just need those two instances. And so we know those can't be admissible for the conditional. It's just like we know P and not P can't be admissible for, for the principal principle. Okay, but that just only scratches the surface of admissibility, it turns out. Those, those are just little tiny bits of information about what's admissible and what isn't. They give you clues, but that's, the story has to be much stronger than that about what we restrict and what we allow. So, here's what's really cool. Lewis, without thinking about the trivialities or any of these formal results, just thinking about uh, intuitions about metaphysics and epistemology of chance, came up with a formal constraint, a formal quantifier restriction, a probabilistic one, which I think makes perfect sense. Uh, and it's this. He says, look, X is admissible if it's screened off, it's screened off, the chance information screens X off from P. So that's what this says. Given the chance information, X doesn't change the probability of P once you know the chances. Another way to put it is, the X's that are admissible are the ones that don't trump the chance information or somehow circumvent it. They only provide information about P that's essentially already contained in the chance information. That's basically what this says. I think that's exactly right. That's what the admissibility restriction should be in the case of chance. 
And it's interesting that he came up with that without thinking about the formal results at all or anything, it's just by intuition, but it makes sense. Those things that are admissible are the ones that don't trump the informational connection between the chances and the proposition. Makes sense. I mean, it fits in with the way he was thinking about chance. Chance is the expert, the nature's yeah. expert. That's right. That's right, exactly. So this makes total sense. I think this is exactly right. And I think, of course, we do need that quantifier restriction. And, and with this restriction, the principle is, seems right. It just seems like a correct principle. It seems like a rational requirement to me and to many others. Now, it, it doesn't say anything. It does. It says that it, it requires x and p to be conditionally independent given the chance information. So it's just a conditional independence claim. It just says that uh, x and p are independent conditional on the chance information. It, I, I, you're using the word triviality, so I guess if the right-hand side is equal to c and the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, then they're both equal to c, okay. Uh, well, the idea here is that the principal principle it should be expected to continue to be a rational requirement when you learn x's that satisfy this. If you learn an x that violates this, then you shouldn't still adhere to the principal principle. That's the idea. Didn't the principal principle say that the right hand side is equal to c? That's right. So you're saying if a left hand, okay. What I'm saying is, it just seems. No, no. So, so let's go back. So the. So the question is, for which x is, the question is, what's the domain of this quantifier? Okay, it doesn't hold for every x, because just put p in there. I think it's Glenn's, Glenn's point is that until you specify the class for which it, it holds in some other way, it, it's, you haven't really said anything. So Lewis specifies it as statements about the past, let's say it's okay. Statements about the future may not be. Oh, well, there's, look, it's a substantive question, which I'm not going to get into, which X is actually satisfied right. this. So oh, I yeah. That's what's yeah, that's a substantive point. question, and that depends on your theory of chance and so on. So, depending on your theory of chance, this could be more or less substantive. I don't really want to get into those oh, details. Okay, it's just yeah. that this, yeah. this condition is so trivial as a condition for the conclusion that I, sorry, that's the point. Well, I'm only going to use an analogy. I'm only using this as an analogy. So all I really care about is the formal structure of the argument. I'm not too concerned with what the substantive theory of chance is. You'd need to plug in a substantive theory of chance to get, to get out a substantive constraint here, for sure. But I'm only using this as an analogy because I'm interested in the conditionals case. What I'm actually interested in is the equation. This is just, this is just a story about a historical analogy. Okay, so then the question is, in light of this screening off idea, what would be the analogous constraint for the equation? What would be the analogous restriction on the quantifier for the resilient equation such that you could expect it to still hold? Well, if you think about this a little bit, it becomes clear that there can only be really one answer to this. And it's this, and then I'm going to give a couple reasons why I think this has to be the right answer. It's a screening off condition, and what it says is the resilient equation should be expected to continue to be have rational force for x's that are such that the antecedent of the conditional screens off x from the consequent. So in other words, x shouldn't contain any information about the consequent that isn't already contained in the antecedent. Okay, now, why? Okay, well, I'm going to say a few things about that. Let me just give you a heuristic argument uh, first. Cons a heuristic argument that actually shows how this, the two principles converge, the principal principle on the one hand and the equation. Consider a conditional with a chance antecedent. So consider a conditional, say, with antecedent P and consequent Q, and let's say Q is the, cl Q is the claim that a coin, it, when tossed, lands heads, and P is the claim that it's a fair coin, that its chance is a half. Now, consider the conditional, uh, if the coin's fair, then it'll land heads. That's the conditional if P then Q. Now, what probability should that have? Well, according to the equation, it should be the conditional probability. But then according to the principal principle, that should be a half. And now what you see is this is a case where the two converge. And the requirement here for the principal principle is a screening off one of the resiliency requirement here. And so therefore, that suggests exactly the same constraint has to hold here. 
So the simple, the simple idea is if you advise a certain level of confidence in a conditional, you're basically presupposing that the person you're talking to doesn't have any inadmissible information with respect to that conditional. So for instance, you're assuming they don't know the consequence false. They don't know the material conditional is true. Just to take a couple examples that lead to triviality. But I think you're assuming something much more general. You're assuming that they don't possess any X which fails to be screened off from the consequent by the antecedent. Because if they did, then I would say all bets are off as to whether they should continue to satisfy the equation. For the same reason that if they possessed inadmissible information about chance, information that wasn't screened off by the chance information, then you shouldn't expect the principal principle to continue to hold for them either. Can you fill that in with an example? The English sentence? And... Yeah. If, if the coin's fair, then it'll land heads. Well, do it without the, the chance antecedent. Oh, no, I'm j this is just a heuristic example to get you in the mindset of why the screening off condition I'm in that makes mindset. sense. I see it like, like yeah. that. But I thought what you're intending to do is to generalize it. Yeah, generally. and I'm proposing it's true in general. And I'm going to give various reasons why that looks to be the right answer. But we'll get to that. I have a bunch of evidence, empirical evidence from linguistics, and I have some theoretical evidence from semantics as well. We'll get to that. But this is just a heuristic argument where examples where the two principles converge, and so. Whatever you say about screening off here, you have to say the same thing here in these cases, because these, these all have to be equal. Okay. Okay, so this is going to be what my proposal is, and then I'm going to look at consequences of the proposal, both in terms of empirical predict linguistic predictions and in terms of stuff in, in the semantics and the logic of the condition. Okay, so here's my proposal. This is, I think, how we should have read Adams and Stalinger all along. And I'm going to call it TE. All rational initial previous functions should satisfy the following restricted version of the resilient equation. For all factual claims P, Q, and X, the resilient equation should hold, provided that X satisfies the screening off condition, the admissibility condition. I think this is a rational crime. It appears that it, it appears that it is, and I'll, I'll explain what the evidence is for that so far. It appears this is a rational requirement, and all I did basically was take what Lewis 1980 said about chance and admissibility restrictions, and basically just did the obvious analogous thing for the conditional. It's just, it's just the, it's sort of the dumbest thing you've tried just by taking what Lewis 1980 does. Okay, so screening off restricts the resilient equation to propositions that don't interfere with or trump what you might call the a priori informational connection between antecedent and consequent of a condition. As I say, I think just intuitively, when we advise a certain level of confidence, we're presupposing that the that the agent, that the hearer doesn't have any information that trumps the informational connection between antecedent and consequent. I think if they did, then it wouldn't be very good advice. If you found that out, then you'd say, well, okay, if you know the material conditional, then okay, forget what I said. <laughs> Or if you know the consequence false, okay, then forget what I said. And I, I just think that's a very natural response to such situations. Okay, now we come to my favorite part of the talk, which is the example. There's, a, there's just a, a key example uh, which brings out many different things about the conditional and about the proposal. And so I wanna, I'm going to dwell on this example for a while. It's a really good example. This is due to Paolo Santorio. I've had a lot of help from various people on this talk, and the Paolo came up with this example, and it's very dialectically useful. So this is just going to be an extremely simple case. We have a fair die that we've tossed, and I want you to consider three factual claims about that die. P asserts that it landed either 1, 3, 5, or 6. Q asserts it landed 6. X asserts it landed even. Okay, first, the principal principle determines what your initial credences should be if this is all you're told about the case. And it's this probability distribution. Let's, let's see why. Okay, so turns out x is just a Boolean function of p and q. We'll get to that later. So all we need to look at is the probabilities over p and q. We've got four states. Okay, let's start with the third one. Why is that zero? It's zero because q entails p. So the state in which Q is true and P is false, that has zero probability. Because if it landed 6, then it landed either 1, 3, 5, or 6. Make sense? This should be pretty straightforward, right? Does that make sense? 
That's zero, because Q entails P. Okay, what about the first state? P and Q. Well, since Q entails P, P and Q is just Q, which says the dilated six. Of course, the chance of that is one sixth. What about P and not Q? Well, P and not Q says one, three, five, or six, but not six. So therefore, one, three, or five. So that's half the possibility, so that's half. And then this one is just one minus those, but you can, you can, you can think through that if you like. So this is just uncontroversial. The principal principle just entails what the probabilities have to be. So this is going to be a knockdown counterexample to the resilient equation. What we're building up to is this is going to be a knockdown, completely uncontroversial counterexample to the resilient equation. All right, well, let's, now that we've got the probabilities, now we can just start calculating. If we apply the equation, it says the probability of the conditional should be the conditional probability, and of course, that's one-fourth. The probability of Q given P is one-fourth, because the probability of 6 given 1, 3, 5, or 6 is one-fourth. Again, not negotiable. That's just chance. That's just the principal principle. And now it follows from the probability calculus that if you can join any proposition X to the conditional, that probability can't be greater than a fourth. That's just by logic and probability calculus, right? Because you've just strengthened the conditional, which you've just calculated to have a probability of fourth. So this has to be less than or equal to a fourth, just by probability calculus, right? So far, so good? OK, now we're in trouble. Now the resilient equation is going to be just false in this case. Let's go from left to right. Look at the probability of the conditional given x. Well, that's just Kolmogorov style defined as a ratio. We know the probability that it's even is a half. And we know this is less than or equal to a fourth. Therefore, this whole ratio is less than or equal to a half. But the right-hand side of the resilient equation, that has to be 1. Why? Because x is just the material conditional. x just says either p is false or q is true. To see that, either p is false, so either it's 2 or 4, or q, or it's 6. That's just to say it's even. So x is the material conditional, p hook q. Therefore, by probability calculus, p and p hook q entails q, so this has to be 1. Resilient equation is false, uncontroversially false. This is just a knockdown counterexample to it. So. Question is a little more thoughtful though to your slide, but you've got three propositions, P, Q, and P, L, Q. Yeah. Is there some space where they live? Yeah, yeah there is. I showed you at the beginning. The space looks like this. It's it's just it's a probability space. They live in this space. They live in a typical finite Kolmogorov probability space. Yeah. And you start with that's there being some zeros somewhere? Or you don't start with any zeros? No zeros, no. The only zeros only come in when you impose the resilient equation. Which I'm giving you a counterexample to right now. Just to just for concreteness. We already knew it was trouble because it led to triviality, but now I'm now I'm giving you just a knockdown. This is just a knockdown counterexample. Totally uncontroversial counterexample. So in, in this particular mm -hmm. example. Would you propose values for that A, B, C, D, E, F in that probability space? I'm, I'm, my proposal doesn't entail values, but it entails an additional constraint, the screening off constraint. So if it, what my proposal entails is that if screening off holds for, an, for a given X, it won't here. See, that's what I'm coming. I'm, you, let, we're about to get to that. The question is, when you look at X, you say, well, why doesn't it hold for X? Answer, because it's inadmissible. It's not screened off. Uh, that's, that's what I'm going, that's my explanation for why it fails. Well, I, I'm fine with this. I guess I'm going back to a different question. I'll, yeah, I'll let, let's, hold, let's hold on to it. Okay, so just to finish the thought, this is a counterexample to the Brazilian equation, but it's not a counterexample to my proposal. It's not a counterexample to TE, because of course, screening off fails. Of course it does. That's what's wrong with the case. This probability is 1, which, of course, is much greater than, the un than the, the, just the probability of Q given P. So you're very far from screening off here, which explains why I think this fails. Now, here's what's really cool. Okay, here's a really cool thing. So I'm going to say a couple more things about the example, because this example <coughs> is, so is so interesting. 
One cool thing is I put a challenge out to all the linguists. Give me all the knockdown counterexamples of the Brazilian equation you've ever heard. And there's tons of them, it turns out. It's an onslaught of examples. Every single one of them is inadmissible. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that's that's why this is the right restriction. Okay, that's part of the, that's part of this part of the story. Now let me let me say a couple more things about this example. Is it okay if I write somewhere? Can I can I write somewhere? Is that a thing I can do? Are there any pens maybe? You can open up. Is there something on, in, inside Let's here? Let's see. Maybe there's a maybe. No. Uh, I might have one. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Just, just yeah. And then if it's not screened off. Um, you always get into trouble, or you might get into trouble. Oh no, no, that's a good question. Um, all I'm saying is, if screening off, then mm -hmm. I'm I'm not saying you'll necessary. I'm not saying nece it's, it's necessary. necessary. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I have to think more about about that. Um, I usually carry one around with me. Here we go. Oh, you're so great. Boom. Thanks a lot. I don't, okay. I don't swear it's going to work. But. That, no, that's great. Okay, perfect. Oh, well, so well, there you go. so here's, here's the cool thing about conditionals. There's, and this example totally illustrates it. There's basically two ways of thinking about the conditional. There's what I'll call the Adam Stallnacher way, in which you have the equation, but not the resilient equation, but you have something like TE. That's what I'm proposing. And then there's what I'm going to call just... Uh, because this is the most natural way to group them, it's what I call import-export theories of the conditional. And what is import-export? Import-export says this. It says x arrow p arrow q is equivalent to x and p arrow q. So this is a nested conditional. If x, then if p, then q. According to import-export, that's equivalent to if both x and p are true, then q is true. Now, many people accept this for the indicative conditional, but here's a really cool result that I also proved in that 2015 paper. The equation, just the, not the resilient equation, not even TE, just the equation itself, when you conjoin it with import-export, that is equivalent to triviality. What this means is these are diametrically opposed views of the conditional. The material conditional analysis goes in here. That satisfies import export. So, like Grice, Jackson, other people who like the material conditional, they like import export. That just is a logical principle for the material condition. It does not play with the equation. What do I mean? When you can join them, they're equivalent to triviality. So, you can't have both. So, what this means is, in light of triviality, you have to either reject the equation or import export. That's your only option. I want to stay over here, but what I want to point out is, I'll just leave this here for a second. What I want to point out is, you can go both ways in this example. If you kind of squint, there's like a duck-rabbit thing that happens with the example. Remember what I said about x. x is the material condition. And what's its probability? A half. It has to be a half by the principal principle. That's different than a fourth. Yes, they, they disagree. And furthermore, if you get yourself into an import exporty state of mind, then when you look at this thing, you say, wait a minute, that's just like the probability of if x, then if p, then q. Right? And if you buy import export, then you're going to say that has to be the same as the probability of q given x and p, which is 1. So, it, so there's a duck-rabbit aspect to this example that I like. If you're a material conditional or an import-export person, you can see that in this example. If you're an Adams thesis person like me, you can, you can see that together with inadmissibility going on in the example. But you can go both ways. And I can certainly get myself in the mindset where I think, ooh, yeah, if I'm in, in an import-export mood, this looks like a counterexample to the equation. Right, because I just say, well, this has to be one, which just means this had to have been false, and maybe it should be a half, like the material conditional or something. Okay, so I just wanted to put, that's a really cool feature of this example, that it illustrates that dichotomy, the two different kinds of views of conditionals, that are, that's brought out by the triviality results. Okay. Now, 
There, uh, yeah. Are there conditionals other than material conditional, which import export? Oh, sure. So what's, can you give me an example? Um, yeah. Well, uh, the intuitionistic conditional does uh, anything basically. So. Right. Okay. Good. Yeah. So, it, a, a key axiom is going to be this one. This is called weakening. Not all theories of the conditional that have this satisfying product but many of them do. X implies if Y then X. Okay, of course, that's not something that the theory, the logic of the conditional that I endorse is gonna is gonna satisfy. Um, but the material does the intuition is the conditional, and a whole bunch of um, conditionals do satisfy import export. Then McGee has a theory of the indicative, he likes import export, so um, he has to radically restrict the equation or reject it, okay? Um, I'll come back to this because I'm going to talk about logics of the conditional in a minute. So here's an interesting question. Why is it that there don't seem to be any knockdown counterexamples, uncontroversial counterexamples to um, the resilient equation that, in, that involve cases where screening off does hold? Okay, so this is an interesting question. I have a partial theoretical explanation for this. Um, and it's based on this theorem. So suppose you've got four propositions, which I'll just call PQ, PROQ, and X. And suppose they satisfy the equation and screening off. Then they're going to satisfy the resilient equation if and only if they satisfy this principle, which I call a priori irrelevance, which says that the thing you learn, X, is independent of the conditional, a priori. Now, that kind of claim uh, at least about most x's. There are some x's for which this is okay, but for most x's, that claim is going to be very controversial in the context of arguing about constraints on the probabilities of the conditional, right? Um, so if you did have a, ca a counterexample that satisfies screening off, it would have to violate this. It would have to take a stand on the relevance of some factual claim to the conditional. It would have to say it is relevant. And that kind of claim is going to be very controversial in this context where you're arguing about probabilistic constraints on the conditional. Contrast that with screening off. My screening off condition doesn't contain conditionals at all. It's a relation between purely factual claims, and so it's orthogonal. Whether it holds is orthogonal to arguments about what probabilities you should assign to conditionals. That's another reason I, li I like that con condition. It's not controversial. In fact, in the case we just saw, it's determined by the principal principle that it's not satisfied. Okay, this is, this is, because these are all factual claims, their probabilities are determined by the principal principle. And so there's nothing controversial that, about the claim that screening off fails. It's just, that's entailed by the principal principle. Whereas, if you had a case where screening off did hold, <laughs> you'd, have to, you'd have to be committed to some, a denial of this kind of claim. And that's going to be very controversial. So I think that partly explains why we're not seeing in the wild uncontroversial counterexamples to the resilient equation that do satisfy screening off, where the screening off condition is satisfied. Okay, I've got two more slides. How am I doing on time? Can I, is it okay if I just keep going? Okay, I got two more slides because I want to get into some of the questions that were asked earlier, which uh, I think everyone was asking something along these lines. So, I'm just telling a story about the epistemology. What are the rational epistemic constraints on an agent's initial credence function and how do those behave? They don't have to be fully resilient, but they should be resilient up to admissibility, which involves screening off. So that's my story about the epistemology, just like Lewis's story about chance. But I haven't said anything about what the conditional is. That is to say, what is its semantics? What is its logic? So I want to spend a couple slides talking about that. That turns out to be a very difficult question, okay, which people have thought about. So I want to talk a little bit about how my models dovetail with some of that stuff. This is, this is the next part of the project, is really getting into the semantics more. I've looked at it a little, so I'll tell you what I know. First thing that has to be discussed is a triviality result due to Alan Hayek, which is completely independent of the Lewisian triviality results. Has absolutely nothing to do with them. He has a purely combinatorial result, very clever result. And what does it show? Basically, what Hayek shows in this paper from 1989 is that if we model the indicative conditional as some kind of relation or function of the antecedent and consequent events, then you can't satisfy the equation for purely combinatorial reasons because there aren't enough unconditional probabilities to pair off with the conditional probabilities. It's just a counting argument. 
and it's actually very elementary, it's clever, but it's a very elementary probabilistic argument where he shows that if this conditional thing is some function or relation between the events P and Q, then the equation can't hold. There just aren't enough unconditional probabilities to go around. So you might wonder, how does that dovetail with what I'm doing? Okay, well, when I set up the models, remember, I didn't say anything about what this random variable I was calling P arrow Q was. I just said, it's like another atomic sense. I assumed nothing. That was important. Okay. So here's how my models work in more detail. For every pair of factual claims P and Q, I'm going to introduce a new atomic sentence, in, which gets extra systematically interpreted as if P then Q. And now that exponentially increases the number of unconditional probabilities just enough to avoid Hayek's result. There'll be just enough unconditional probabilities to pair up with the conditional probabilities. So it's no coincidence that I introduce a, a new atomic sense that's independent of the others. You need that exponential increase in unconditional probabilities in order to avoid the combinatorial argument. Now, that leaves open a very important question, which is, how does your story about the epistemology, how does that interact with the semantics and the logic of the conditional. So if you talk to linguists or logicians who are interested in conditional semantics or conditional logic, they tend to like to have stories about the meaning of the conditional that are compositional or systematic in certain ways, where ideally the compound is some, the semantic value of the compound is some function of the semantic values of the individual events. Well, we can't do that <laughs> because of Hayek's result. So whatever the semantics is going to look like, it's going to have to be a lot more complicated than that. We already, we already know that. If it's going to play with my proposal, it's going to have to be more complicated than that. So let me say a little bit about, I've just started looking at these conditional logics and conditional semantics, and the good news is it looks like they, it plays really well with the existing ones. So I'm going to give you one example um, that's really nice. Okay, so... Um, I wrote another paper, which I didn't think was going to be relevant to this paper, but actually now is turning out to be very relevant, and that was about the logic of the conditional. So Alan Gibbard has this really cool argument to the effect that if a conditional satisfies import-export, then it collapses to a very strong conditional. He thought it was the classical material conditional. That's not true. In the paper I wrote, I show it's not quite right. You get collapsed to intuitionism, which is a little weaker, but still pretty bad. That <laughs> nobody thinks the indicative is intuitionistic either. Um, and so I've got this paper where I, where I show that relative to a very weak background theory for the conditional called first degree entanglement, which basically has very few theorems for the conditional, it's super weak. Everyone accepts at least those principles for the conditional. Once you add import-export, then you get collapsed to intuitionism, which is very strong. It's a very strong logic. It's not quite classical, but it's still very strong. It's a lot stronger than people would like for the indicative. That's a nice argument against import-export that's independent of this stuff involving the Adams thesis. Now, Van Frossen wrote a really wonderful paper in the 70s called Probabilities of Conditionals, in which he explored what semantics would have to look like if they're going to satisfy the equation. Now, he knew that you couldn't have import-export in general because you get triviality, so his models restrict the amount of nesting you can have. And, and so it's, a very, it's, a, it's essentially a kind of restriction on import-export and, and the kinds of instances of import-export that can hold. Now what's really cool about this is he has, a, he has what he calls a minimal logic before he gets into the, 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 the gnarly controversial stuff. He has a minimal logic. That minimal logic is basically FDE, which was the background logic I used for Gibbard, together with the following principle. This says the conjunction of A and if A then B is equivalent to the conjunction A and B. Not a crazy, not a crazy principle. Turns out you can add that to FDE and all the Gibbard stuff still goes through the way it did before. It doesn't, it doesn't interfere with any of that. And here's a really neat thing. The probabilistic equivalent of this, the one that says the probability of this has to always equal the probability of that, follows from my principle. Okay, so because his logic satisfies this, it entails that the antecedent is probably independent of the conditional. Okay, so, so why, why is that? It might be worth just looking at that for a second. It's actually a pretty simple argument. 
And then we're going to see that there's an independent argument for the principle coming from my principle TE. It directly is a direct consequence of TE. So here's, so here's, let's take this principle three that Van Frossen has. It says that A and if A then B is equivalent to the conjunction A and B. And now let's, uh, let's look at the probability of A arrow B given the antecedent A. Okay, well, by definition, that's just a ratio where you can join the, the two things and you divide by the probability of A, right? Now, if you apply principle three, then this ratio becomes the probability of A and B over the probability of A, which is just the conditional probability of B given A. And therefore, this principle entails that the antecedent is independent of the conditional. That just follows from three, okay? Here's a cool point of convergence. This follows from my principle because, of course, P screens off P from Q. Of course, P screens off itself from Q because the probability of Q given P and P, that's just probably Q and P given P. And so that means that instance of the resilient equation has to hold, according to me, which just is the independence of the antecedent from the conditional. And so, Van Frossen's got this minimal logic. My principle entails the key principle in his minimal logic, the probabilistic analog of the key principle in his minimal logic. Here's why I like that. That means that the epistemology I was doing dovetails beautifully with Van Frossen's semantics. In fact, it entails the key axiom independently. My reasons for, for wanting this just have to do with screening off. It's not because I want to say these are logically equivalent. I have an independent argument, which is that the resilient equation should hold whenever screening off holds. And by logic, screening off is going to hold for P itself. And therefore, the antecedent of a conditional has to be independent, according to me, of the conditional. Stallnecker's logic also has that, satisfies that principle. Um, Richard Bradley wrote a book recently where he does a probabilistic semantics for the conditional. His logic has that principle. So this principle is, seems to be a point of convergence of all the kinds of semantics that are supposed to play with the equation. And it just falls out of my proposal that you get this key axiom, the probabilistic version. That just falls out. For, not for logical reasons, just because of screening off. So the next step in this project is to continue looking at how the epistemology plays with different semantics. So I'm, I'm looking at Van Frossen right now and Stallnecker, and I also want to look at Bradley's system. But it appears to me that this is going to fit really well with these approaches. In fact, it's going to imply, I think, the key axiom that sets, sets those semantics apart from other semantics of the condition. OK, uh, I'm done. Thanks. Yes. So my question is, we take that example uh, with the uh, yeah. P and Q being the two uh, uh, dice issues, and fill out that uh, table with the probabilities, uh, the joint probabilities for PQ and P. They won't all be determined in general. So they'll be... They won't be determined. No, they'll be... In this example, you can't tell me what they are? No, I can't. I mean, that's going to require further choices um, that, at this point, I'm not prepared to make. I mean, it, ideally, you'd, you'd want to be able to say more about that. But, I, but the purpose of this example here is just a dialectical one to illustrate that the resilient equation is false, but it's false, because I think, because screening off fails. Well, we know about this die. We know everything there is to know about it. 